Well, good evening, everyone. And it's the second Stars of Tomorrow concert of the season. And how wonderful it is to see so many of you here back uh, making music. I'm Benjamin Rowe, the president and CEO of the Heifetz Institute, Nicholas Kitchen, our artistic director. And I want to begin tonight with a few names. James and Paula Zimmerman, Lawrence Kavritz, Susan Dupree, Michael and Mary Jim Quillen, Stanley and Lynn Grimm, Mark Keeler, Cleveland and Ray Hickman, Philip and Lois Ziegler, Rona Eisner, Paul and Margaret Werley. They're in the back of your program here because this year we don't have, as of course we've had to change a lot of things, and one thing that we had to change was having a big giant 80 page program uh, schedule because we didn't even know we were going to have that many programs. So we don't have the glossy ads, we don't have all the glossy background information and program information, and what for many people is the part that they all look at first, which is the back of the book where all the donors are. <laughs> Who are they and how much do they give? I know, I don't know how it works. Um, I make a joke about that, but for the last 18 months, it has been those little names uh, that have really uh, kept us going and really have kept us all and given us the ability to be with you here tonight. And so what we decided this year was we cannot publish a 20-page addendum, um, but what we will be doing every night is listening um, about a dozen or so of the people who have made contributions to the Institute and made this summer festival of concerts possible. So uh, get used to it because we think this is something that's really important, really vitally important, vi vitally meaning life, uh, to this institute. And Nick has a few thoughts about tonight's concert to share as well. Well, it is really a nice chance to just acknowledge that that, that generosity and that giving that, uh, that comes from the donors and that comes from all of you and that comes when we just even put our hands together and, and just show the appreciation for the great things that these performers have just done. That's really what just buoys the whole effort and makes it uh, kind of float and go forward and it's, it's pretty amazing to just kind of get the chance to look at each other now and, and realize that we, uh, we can treasure again the chance to really share this great space and these sounds that are going to just emanate from these brilliant players and, and just celebrate the fact that we're all together doing it. And so I guess that's just a way of saying thank you uh, to all those people and all of you who make all of this happen. And uh, you know, we were talking backstage that I think for almost everyone, I believe it may be everyone who is on stage tonight, this is their first time playing for an audience for more than a year. And uh, of course, we're very thrilled to have been able to get the Institute up and running so that all of these really brilliant young players can have just the richest kind of environment uh, to just develop their gifts. And uh, it is amazing. We had a concert just two days ago and people played just beautifully. And I know it's going to be that way tonight. So I think now maybe that's enough of us talking and we'll get on to the music. And just so happy to see you all and so happy to share this all together. Thank you. I am 19, I'm a cellist from Palo Alto, California, and today I will be playing for you the prelude to Bach's fifth cello suite in C minor. However, for those of you who are already familiar with the piece, it might sound a little bit different than you're used to, because I will not actually be playing Bach's original version for the cello. This is because we don't actually have access to Bach's original version for the cello. What we do have is 
Uh, we don't have anything in his original handwriting. What we do have are a bunch of copies, but these copies often conflict with each other and leave us cellists more confused and enlightened. So, the fifth suite is an, ex is an exception to the sixth suites not being written by Bach's own hand. We don't have that. Because we have the lute suite in G minor, which he did, which we do have his own autograph man manuscript. And the lute suite in G minor, as it turns out, is almost an exact copy of the cello suite in C minor, um, except for a different instrument and in a different key. <laughs> so, it, for the most part, it's the same. There are a few added bass notes, um, ornamentations, a few harmony changes, and uh, definitely a lot more chords. But it, it's for the, for the most part, it's pretty similar. So it's a unique opportunity for cellists to see what Bach would have wanted for his own cello suites. So my teacher, Professor Lawrence Lesser, who actually is in the audience with us today, um, arranged the lute suite in, C, uh, in G minor back onto the cello um, in C minor. And so I'll be playing the prelude of that today. Um, I think it's a wonderful opportunity to gain some new perspective on this monumental work. Thank you.
everyone. My name is Margo Cunningham. I'm 19 years old and I'm from Greensboro, North Carolina. We'll be performing the second movement of the F minor sonata by Johannes Brahms. Nearing the end of his life, Brahms composed two sonatas for clarinet and piano that he later transcribed for viola and piano. The piece begins with the viola stating the melody that then returns throughout the piece, the variations in the piano part. This piece is very nostalgic for me because I first learned it during a very special time in my life, which was my freshman year of college. This time was filled with the creation of great friendships and memories I'll never forget. I hope this performance will be a reflective performance for you and will take you back to cherished moments of your life too. Thank you for coming.
is Maya Anjali Buchanan. I am 21 years old. I'm from Rapid City, South Dakota, and I currently study in Philadelphia at the Curtis Institute of Music. So before I talk a little bit about my piece, I just wanted to say a huge thank you to everyone who's here. It's been a long time since I've played for a live audience, so I'm really, really looking forward to it. So today I will be playing Dvorak's Romance in F minor. Dvorak was a Czech composer and he lived in the late 1800s. He actually originally wrote this piece as a quartet in 1873, and the quartet didn't do very well because Dvorak wasn't very well known at the time. However, he revisited the quartet a little bit later on in his life and turned the second movement into the piece that I'm about to play for you. So what was originally the second movement of a string quartet is now the piece that Balin and I will play together on violin and piano. So with that being said, I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. 
I'm from Quincy, Massachusetts, and I currently study at the New England Conservatory. With my pianist, Andrew Rosenblum, we will be playing the first movement from Grieg's Violin Sonata No. 3 in C minor. Grieg wrote a total of three violin sonatas, and all reference Norwegian folk songs. Norwegian instrumental folk music is usually built on short melodic themes that are repeated with some variations. The movement I'll be playing tonight has two very contrasting themes. The first is very dark, bold, heroic, even agitated. Later follows a more lyrical, warm, and tender melody. Though the themes may seem simple, I believe they beautifully capture both ends of the spectrum of human emotion. I hope you enjoy listening as much as I enjoy playing this piece. Thank you.
Okay, it's that time. Uh, we first have to uh, correct the record here in, in case there's a, a little uh, confusion. Um, you know, I come out usually here for the start of the second half and give you what I call the commercials. Um, important note here, um, because we'll be doing all of our Stars of Tomorrow concerts here at 7.30 uh, in the evening on Tuesdays and Thursdays. And our Celebrity Series concert with our faculty is also here, and it is at our usual Celebrity Series time of 6 o'clock. Not 7.30 as it says in your program, but at 6 o'clock. Do repeat, 6 o'clock. Management regrets the error. Um, and of course our Sunday matinees are at 2 o'clock. Tomorrow we actually have um, a double header. We'll be doing our first ever concert at the Stanton Augusta Art Center, where we're calling Fridays at the Gallery. That's at 1 o'clock. It is a free concert. Uh, we have a very small number of tickets left. Uh, they're free, but you do have to reserve in advance. Someone's just telling me zero. Well, we might, we might find some more. <laughs> You know, you might look under the parsley on the plate, and there might be a few more. That was an old joke in the New Yorker. A long time. <laughs> anyway, uh, we do have a really wonderful weekend ahead. Besides the, the uh, concert um, at the gallery, uh, we begin every day now in the summertime with a bit of Bach. At every day at about 9 o'clock, we will post a fresh Bach performance on our website, on our YouTube channel, and on Facebook. The 1 o'clock concert at the gallery, at 6 o'clock uh, will be our first Celebrity Series uh, concert of the season, Bach as one and Brahms as six. The one is the redoubtable Lawrence Lesser, uh, who will be playing the complete Bach third cello suite, and that is truly an event for all of us, and we're so pleased to have Professor Lesser here with us. And then we'll be having another all-star performance by our faculty, who are all-stars, uh, including Shmuel Ashkenazi, Shannon Lee, Michael Klotz, and that violist named Nicholas Kitchen. Woo, <laughs> is right. And our cellist Antonio Lisi and David Gaber playing the magnificent Brahms string sextet number two. That's truly going to be an event. And on Saturday, we also have a doubleheader because we'll be heading out to Charlottesville for our annual Independence Day concert. Uh, that will be at Monroe's Highland, the uh, home of the nation's sixth president. Uh, and then we'll be doing our first Hyphus Hoot Nanny of the season at 7.30 in a new location at the Blackburn, uh, the Great Hall of Blackburn, where our air concerts took place. That will be where the Hoot Nanny is. Um, a little bit different this year, but a uh, nice, big, spacious, airy place with lots of ventilation, should you be wondering. And back here again at 2 o'clock on Sunday for our Sunday matinee. And in case you haven't heard, we do have a very special guest, both for the Hoot Nannies uh, the Independence Day concert, and for our Sunday matinee, uh, the voice of an angel, Angel Lazaro, will be back with us, uh, as well as many other um, surprises on that program. So we do hope to see you here, here or there, uh, for some of our concerts um, ahead. Uh, now, I think it's also important to note, as we're all sort of beginning and gearing up, and as we said on Tuesday, we're in a place that we didn't quite expect we could be, we didn't dare dream we could be, um, but of course, we're also trying to be extremely careful um, in this surrounding and everywhere else. That's why we're not in Francis Auditorium. The, uh, when we were calculating social distance seating, Francis Auditorium returned the number of 50. And we thought, mm, that might not quite be enough. So um, here we can have something approaching a normal audience. We do have a socially distance seating uh, option for people if they prefer it. Every hyphen student, by the way, gets one of these when they arrive, because we're all about the branding, of course. <laughs> um, and, and someone asked, I think it's worth sort of sharing with all of you about what, we're been, what we've been doing. Um, every student that arrives here on campus uh, immediately gets um, what we call a rapid test. Um, and we, when they pass that rapid test, um, they're allowed to move into a special room. We're only bringing, as I think I said before, we're only bringing 16 students on campus uh, every week so that uh, we can kind of manage uh, the potential for any super spreader event. We have quarantine rooms for those students. Of the 98 students that are coming to Heifetz at one point or another or, or studying, um, all but eight um, have been vaccinated. There are five who have received a first dose. 
Um, and for those, though, that, that choose to, of course, the people have a lot of reasons. Um, we're certainly doing everything. We're not saying students that aren't vaccinated can't come, but we're also trying to maintain extremely important protocols. We're doing tests, we're, and we have a whole system for what happens if there's a positive test. Thank goodness, after a couple of weeks, we've not had any positive tests. But we are monitoring it very carefully to ensure the safety of our students and, of course, the safety of all of you. So uh, if you ever have any questions about that over the course, and of course, this is still uh, a developing situation. This is not over yet, and we're very mindful of that. And we really do want to make sure that we all have a chance to enjoy this glorious music together. So I'm going to cut short the commercial right now. Uh, you, you've got a public service announcement as well. Um, and uh, we have more fabulous performances ahead of you for uh, the rest of this program. So thanks again for being here. Strauss's Violin Sonata. This is one of my favorite pieces, and I'm so happy to be able to share it with you. It is filled with lush melodies, spontaneity, and a passionate, youthful energy. Strauss composed this early in his career when he fell in love with a woman, and I believe that all of his feelings of love are wrapped into one package in this piece. I hope you enjoy. Thank you very much.
first learning a new piece of music was to sit down with my mom and together we would make up a story to go along with the music. And we did this so that I was, I was better able to understand and connect to the music on a deeper and more emotional level. And the piece that we will be performing for you this evening, the Debussy Cello Sonata, has a story of its own. 
and that is the story of Pierrot. And Pierrot was a pantomime, or a sad clown, and Pierrot was madly in love with his beloved. And so in the first movement of the sonata, the prologue, he is jolted awake in the middle of the night, and he, his heart, his heart is aching, and he realizes that he's missing his beloved, he misses her presence. And so in the second movement, he goes out into the night, and he looks for her, and he tries to serenade her, but no matter what he does, she is cold towards him, and she rejects him, and he is left heartbroken at his unrequited love. And so in the last movement, the finale, um, Piero tries to console himself and his broken heart, but he is unable to mask his pain at, at his lost love. And as an instrumentalist, we don't have words to go along with the music that we, that we are playing, you know, as a singer would, but we still have very strong and very intense emotions that we are desperate to get to our audience. And so for me, personally, knowing this story has helped me to connect and understand to this sonata um, in a more personal and more sincere way. It has made the music come alive to me, and I hope it will come alive for you as well. So thank you so much for being here, and I hope you enjoy.